Hi everyone, I'm Julie Fleshman, President and CEO of PanCan. I'm so glad to be with all of you today for a conversation about diet and nutrition, what pancreatic cancer patients and caregivers need to know. Thank you for joining us. Diet and nutrition are so important during every part of the pancreatic cancer journey. In fact, good nutrition care improves outcomes and is critical for every patient's quality of life. PanCan recommends that all patients have access to pancreatic enzymes and see a registered dietitian. Hopefully you have seen the great information on our website and the PanCan blog on our homepage about diet and nutrition. We have a lot of helpful tips and guidance year round and especially this month, which is National Nutrition Month. Today, we're talking about why it's so important to have a dietitian as part of every pancreatic cancer patient's healthcare team. We have dietitians here to discuss their role and how they can help. We'll talk about pancreatic enzymes and the difference they can make with digestion. We'll share how PanCan Patient Services helps patients and caregivers with support related to this topic, and we'll hear from someone who can speak from her very personal experience about how important diet and nutrition are for patients after treatment and surgery and moving forward. There will be a lot of information provided, so please know that PanCan's Patient Services Helpline is available to you via phone and email Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. Through our free services, you will be connected to an expert case manager who can provide answers to your questions. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsors, Ipsen and Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, I'd also like to thank our scientific and medical affairs industry members, AbbVie, AstraZeneca, Fibrogen, Immunovia, Ipsen, LabCorp Oncology, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, Novacure, Tempest, Time, and ViewRay. And finally, a special thank you to all of our donors who have joined today to learn more about diet and nutrition and how PanCan Patient Services is helping patients and caregivers. Your giving directly supports this critical service and all of PanCan's work. I'd like to start by telling you about PanCan and our comprehensive approach to fighting pancreatic cancer. We will invest over $28 million this year in research that is advancing early detection strategies for pancreatic cancer and accelerating new treatment options for patients. We also advocate in Washington, D.C. to increase the federal resources that are available to pancreatic cancer researchers nationwide. Our amazing patient services program is available to anyone free of charge and provides the opportunity to speak to a trained case manager and get comprehensive information about the disease. And finally, through a community engagement, we work with our incredible volunteer network. PanCan has 58 volunteer affiliates across the country that raise awareness of the disease and PanCan and raise funds through PanCam Purple Stride events that help support our mission. I encourage you to visit our website at pancan.org to learn more. And please register to attend a PanCam Purple Stride event in your community. 60 events nationwide will happen on the same day next month on Saturday, April 30th, 2022. It will be one big day for our community. Actor, writer, and producer Mindy Kaling is our PanCam Purple Stride Ambassador to this year, and we are so thrilled to have her support. So today, I'm excited to introduce you to four special guests. Janine Mills is a clinical oncology dietitian at Norris Cotton Cancer Center at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Janine is also a member of PanCan's Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Maria Petzl is a senior clinical dietitian with the Pancreas Surgery Program at MD Anderson Cancer Center and a past member of PanCan's Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Daima Bates is a PanCan Patient Services Manager. Like all of our PanCan Services case managers, she is highly trained on all things pancreatic cancer. 
Our case managers speak with pancreatic cancer patients and caregivers every day, answering questions about the disease, treatment, diet and nutrition, and living with pancreatic cancer. And finally, Jennifer Lambert, a pancreatic cancer survivor. Jennifer will share how a dietitian and PanCan helped her after the Whipple surgery and her chemo treatments, and she and is still helping her today. Thank you all for being here. Let's get started. Janine, so I'm gonna start with you. Why is it so important that a pancreatic cancer patient consult with a registered dietitian? Um, well, that's pretty easy. We are the experts on the team and as far as nutrition goes, I think more importantly that we're meeting patients um, as soon as they're diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So many of them present with challenges that compromise their ability to eat even before treatment initiates. So it's actually getting them on board with why nutrition is important. Many of them don't understand why they're even seeing a dietitian <laughs> until we we tell them the importance of nutrition. I think too, um, when we talk about the goals of nutrition, we can inform them the importance in terms of reversing poor nutrition, the impact that nutrition plays on treatment, um, lets them, allows them to stay on course for treatment, um, ensures that they get through treatment without treatment breaks. Um, in terms of managing symptoms, we play a key role um, maintaining their weight, um, supporting their, their efforts in maintaining their weight, and of course, all of this and maximizing their quality of life. Um, and I think too, that we continue to serve on their team as part, as, their, as part of their care team and as a resource that they continue to circle back to. Yeah, great. And such a good reminder that patients should be talking to a dietitian immediately after their diagnosis early in their care. So Janine, can you explain how the dietitian works with the oncologist and the rest of the patient's care team? Yeah, so that's that's probably one of the best parts of my job um, is the, you know, the elbow to elbow with the rest of the team. With the oncologist, it's understanding the care plan or even the change in the treatment regimen. Um, it's working with uh, a social worker um, in terms of identifying any financial burdens or food insecurities um, with a nurse navigator who can tap me on the shoulder if issues come up before I even know about them with patients. Um, I can't imagine not working with the rest of my team. They enable me to do the best job that I can in terms of caring for our patients. That's so important, and it really is wonderful how you work together as a team in order to provide the very best care to patients and to help support their families as well. So Maria, can you describe what a patient might expect of their first appointment with a registered dietitian, and how should they prepare for that appointment? Sure. So the first appointment, we're going to gather information. We're going to ask quite a few questions gathering information about current intake and how that relates or compares to a person's usual intake. We're also going to um, gather some weight history. So we'll go into a little bit more depth than maybe just asking what's your current weight, what was your weight a month ago, but really diving into their weight history. And then we're going to try to assess how well, what they're eating, their ability to eat and get nutrients and how well the body's processing that. So we do get pretty familiar with patients pretty quickly um, because we're going to ask detailed questions about how they feel after they eat and about digestive symptoms and really detailed questions about bowel movements. Um, it, it can be uncomfortable at first uh, because we're just meeting and just getting to know each other, but getting that information really does give us a good indication of how well their body is processing food and allows us to make more detailed and appropriate recommendations. In a visit in person, we might also perform a brief uh, nutrition-focused physical assessment. If we're doing a visit virtually, we may ask the patient to do something like turn their head to the side or pull back their shirt and show us their collar bone. That's to help give us an idea of critical areas of muscle or fat that may be lost if somebody has had significant weight loss. And then once we gather this information, 
we're going to provide nutrition recommendations for how an individual can help better meet or improve their intake of food. And then also on side effect management, the side effects that they're having currently that are related to the, the disease or to the treatment. And also if they're meeting with us early, we can help give guidance on anticipated side effects based on that planned treatment regimen. We can give some nutrition tips that they can start working on or be prepared for potential side effects. And lastly, we may work with the team and request or suggest some, pre some prescription medications. Um, with dietitians, oftentimes the things that we work with teams uh, for are going to be um, regarding the anti-nausea regimen, bowel management, and probably most importantly, pancreatic enzyme prescription and adjustments to dosage. Great. It's all so important. And we all know that we just feel better when we've had a good meal and feel satisfied. And so certainly when you're going through something like pancreatic cancer, you want to have someone helping you with all of those things. So Maria, how can a patient access a registered dietitian if they're not at a large cancer center? So uh, dietitians at cancer centers or the availability of dietitians at cancer centers is certainly growing. So even if they're not at a large cancer center, there, there may be, and hopefully there's access to a dietitian. It might be that that dietitian is only at the cancer center certain days of the week, but definitely starting by asking for an appointment with the registered dietitian. And unfortunately, I find sometimes that because doctors are so focused really on the, the treatment side of things, maybe they don't know exactly who the dietitian is or how to get their patient to the dietitian. Mm -hmm. So if met with an initial, um, maybe not denial, but an initial um, uh, aspect of not really knowing exactly where to refer you to, certainly asking the nurse practitioner, the PA, the nurse in the clinic, the infusion room nurse, somebody's going to know how to reach, reach the dietitian. Um, if there is not a dietitian readily available, certainly turning to PanCan patient services as they have a list of dietitians and can help narrow that down to uh, dietitians and oncology dietitians in your area. Terrific. Yeah, this is one of those examples of being a good patient advocate and you have to go in and 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 find what you need, but 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 there are resources available and, and as you said, PanCan can ensure um, to help patients find a dietitian in their area. So Jennifer, we're so thrilled to have a pancreatic cancer survivor with us today. Um, I understand that you've taken great care with your nutrition and that you have consulted with a dietitian. Can you describe why you take your nutrition so seriously? and the benefits that you've experienced while working with a dietitian? Yes. Um, first, I want to say it's such an honor uh, to be a part of this. And I noticed that I was the only person without any initials after my name. And I thought, well, maybe we can add PCS, pancreatic <laughs> cancer survivor, as my initials. But, um, but yeah, I actually reached out to work with a dietitian it's for a couple reasons um, a year ago, and that was a year and a half after my Whipple surgery and after completing my um, chemo. So fortunately, I didn't have, I didn't experience dumping syndrome, though a lot of the really tough uh, things that pancreatic cancer patients can go through, I, I didn't have. Um, but what was interesting is in every single one of my scans, my CT scans, the radiologist noted no cancer, you know, whatever fancy words, how you say that, uh, no cancer noted, abundant stool throughout colon. So I think it maybe took me getting pancreatic cancer to kind of confirm what I've suspected my whole life of basically chronic constipation. And so I reached out to the dietitian for help with that. And then also, I don't know if it was Whipple or chemo, you guys might know, um, I, I have become, since my treatment for pancreatic cancer, uh, gluten sensitive and lactose sensitive. Um, not completely allergic or intolerant, but just sensitive. And that's improved some, but I still, I still need to watch it. So those are why I reached out. And also, as you guys have already um, shown, just to have someone really a friend 
that I could talk to about my bowel movements and gas and bloating and how often and how much and what's the consistency and things that you're taught you don't talk about those things and you know with, with other people so just the comfort of knowing that I can say hey here's what happened today um it was so great and one of the things that was extremely helpful is she had me keep a food journal and that was really really helpful and I would write down you know what I ate how much fluids I learned I got many pages to tell me how much fiber was in things so I learned about monitoring my fiber um and I write in there when I had bowel movements and and how that was going so I, it was extremely beneficial and continues to be. Um, I still have a food journal um, that that just it, it's really, really helpful. That's so terrific. And you so you've shared some of the things that you've learned from a dietitian, but can you share one thing that you learned from a dietitian that surprised you? That a lot of things, I thought basically that anything was crunchy, that was crunchy had fiber. That's not true. <laughs> And so when I got the many pages of things that were high fiber, I was like, wow, I didn't know that, that I had a lot of fiber. And so just learning things like that, what has a lot of fiber, what has protein, what, you know, just um, having a resource to guide me in my food choices. Yeah, wonderful. I think we could all use a dietitian in our life, right? Um, but so important for a pancreatic cancer patient. So Janine, recognizing that every patient, of course, is different. If you were to provide general nutritional advice to pancreatic cancer patients regarding the foods that they eat, what would it be? Yeah, so that sort of brings me back to um, an initial meeting with a patient newly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I think they arrive into the clinic room wondering um, if they're going to be put on a diet, honestly. And I think so many of them have already gone online to, um, to, to investigate how they should be eating. So uh, some of my time is actually dispelling some of the myths. Um, some of these patients have put themselves on, on you know, very rigorous, low fat or no fat kinds of diets from what they've read. Um, or they've, you know, done something very extreme because they don't know otherwise. So I think that a lot of it initially for me is educating patients about protein, calories, carbohydrate, fat. Um, and then it's troubleshooting initially with patients. Um, it, in, in the pancreatic cancer clinic that I work in, obviously we're seeing these patients first time. So it's really um, jumping to what is compromising their ability to eat because we see that just on diagnosis, right? Be, even before they start treatment, they have complaints of feeling full quickly. So we may be talking about, you know, gearing down to consuming six or eight small volume meals in a day, um, pacing their eating um, with the goal of weight maintenance because so many of our patients at diagnosis come to us with weight loss, or it may be even talking with them about um, signs and symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency and getting them started on enzymes even before they start treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I think if that maybe answers the question, I think a lot of it is um, really dispelling myths, talking with patients, sharing good resources, um, we try to keep patients as best as possible in the sort of the framework of healthy eating, um, but we tend to bend a lot um, for our patients who have very low appetite, who, who have lost a lot of their favorite foods become their most unfavorite foods, um, or, or they have a gut that's been altered because of surgery. So we're trying to work as healthy of a diet as we possibly can for these patients, but again, we're strongly catering to, to preferences. Yep. So along those same lines, what is your general advice to patients about supplements? And are there supplements that can help patients with certain symptoms that they're having? Okay. That's, yeah, that's a great question because it comes up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, for patients, I think there's three things that I would tell them about supplements. Um, I would, I would 
I would um, really advocate that they understand what they're taking. Um, that's first and foremost. Maybe someone told them that they should be taking it or our friend took it while they were on treatment. Um, if they don't have you know, the time or they don't, have, they don't know how to find out more about the supplements they're taking, to, to write them down, bring them in a bag to their clinic visit, because we're all very interested as a team in knowing and understanding what they're taking. We wanna know if there's any impact that it may have on side effects with treatment um, or um, interactions with other medications or other supplements. Um, we want to know about the safety and efficacies of these supplements, mostly to really to educate our patients about it so that they can make a choice of whether they remain on these supplements. Um, there, and then finally, sharing some really good resources with our patients to include um, consumerlabs.com, um, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has an excellent website dedicated to herbal supplements. The NIH um, has a wonderful website just on um, dietary supplements, Office of Dietary Supplements. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and then to ask, answer the, the third part of that question would be, um, you know, we know very little but about micronutrient deficiencies in pancreatic cancer patients. And, and, and most often we're looking for deficiencies um, after surgeries, like a, having a Whipple, which certainly can alter the GI tract, its ability to absorb nutrients, um, lending more to pancreatic insufficiency. So you do see deficiencies in vitamin B12, fat-soluble vitamins, um, iron deficiency because the duodenum's been removed, and that's where you have a fair amount of absorption of iron. Um, so we are, um, of course, investigating all of those and then um, repleting our patients um, so that they are um, back to normal levels, but then continuing to survey those um, deficiencies, um, especially after Whipple. And, and, and to that point, we know that patients who have gone through the Whipple procedure have very specific nutritional needs, as do patients, though, who are going, um, you know, going through chemotherapy. So can you speak to both of those scenarios, the Whipple procedure and, and, and getting chemotherapy? Yeah, so the Whipple procedure in of itself, because of the change in, in the gut um, anatomy after surgery, Patients can run into issues of delayed gastric emptying, uh, pancreatic insufficiency, um, dumping syndrome, low appetite, nausea, taste changes, all of that. Um, and so we are managing um, our patients by, um, you know, uh, uh, managing their nutrition depending on what is impacting them most. Um, and then in terms of chemotherapy, it depends on the chemotherapy, um, how aggressive the, the, the treatment regimen is. It might be finding foods um, that um, if a patient's experiencing cold sensitivities, they can't find foods at room temperature that are appealing to them, or if they're experiencing taste changes, nothing tastes great to them or everything tastes muted, um, or if it's um, an alteration in their bowels because of something like fulfurinox where they'll have an alteration of constipation to um, loose stools. Um, all of that is what we're trying to help on the team to help manage these patients get through treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of individually, you know, with surgery, it's, it's the mechanical alteration in, in the gut because of the surgery itself. With treatment, it's drugs and, and chemotherapy, immunotherapy that patients are getting that we may have to adjust diet to, to best support our patients through treatment. Great. Yeah. And listening to you, it just shows how important it is for you to be working with that patient based on what they're going through, what treatment they're having, whether they've had surgery or not, and that you can then really cater your advice to that particular patient. That's terrific. So, so Maria, let's talk about the ever important pancreatic enzymes issue. This is a question that comes up a lot. What adv advice would you give patients about pancreatic enzymes? Yes, pancreatic enzymes, these can be very important to many, if not most of our patients with pancreatic cancer at some point during their journey. Um, I think the first thing is for patients 
to know that even if they don't present with symptoms of pancreatic excretin insufficiency or pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, that it can develop over time or it could present after treatment such as radiation therapy or surgery. So being familiar with the symptoms I think is really important. So the symptoms of enzyme insufficiency are feelings of gas, excessive gas or bloating, uh, cramping, indigestion, pain after meals, um, changes in bowel movements. So bowel movements that become more frequent, uh, bowel movements that are floating or have the appearance of fat, um, also lighter colored or yellow bowel movements, um, or uh, in the absence of any of these previous symptoms, just unexplained weight loss. So if an individual is, is otherwise eating pretty regularly, mm -hmm. um, eating regular amounts of food, but having weight loss despite, that could also be a symptom of enzyme insufficiency. So first and foremost is patients being familiar with, with those potential symptoms of excrement insufficiency. Um, and if you have those symptoms, then talking with your team, talking with the doctor, the nurse practitioner, the PA, and really um, discussing those symptoms so that they'll be able to prescribe the appropriate, um, the appropriate enzyme for you. Um, now, prescription pancreatic enzymes, though there are um, some over-the-counter products, they over-the-counter products really um, are not regulated by the FDA. So there is no standardization in processing or manufacturing. And then also they typically tend to be much lower in concentration than the prescription enzymes. So we really do want to work with the, with the team to get a prescription for enzymes. Um, with regards to dosage, there's not a one size fits all. And I think that patients find this as they talk with each other. Oh, I'm on this enzyme and I take this many capsules with meals and somebody else may take half that number of capsules. There's not a one size fits all. Typically, there's generally a starting dose um, or a couple different starting doses that, that prescribers may prescribe. Um, but there's a lot of individual need. So patients should know that once they're started on enzymes, they should work with the dietitian and work with the prescriber to make adjustments until they find the amount of enzymes that is appropriate for them to minimize those side effects or those symptoms that they were having of pancreatic insufficiency. Yeah. Generally, when a patient started on enzymes, they're going to notice a difference in a, within about three days of starting enzymes or making a dose adjustment. Now, just a couple other little pearls that I think are really important is that if patients are taking prescription pain medication, when they start pancreatic enzymes, they may see more of the effect, the constipating effect of those pain medications. So it's important to have a bowel management plan um, to utilize if constipation develops. Also, when taking enzymes, it's really important that if you're taking multiple capsules of enzymes, that the first capsule you take at the very beginning of the meal, right with your right before, or right after your first bite of food. And then ultimately, most patients benefit from distributing the additional capsules through the meal rather than taking all of them at the start of the meal or of the snack. And then lastly, because enzymes are only available as a brand name prescription medication, sometimes the cost can be um, fairly expensive. So working with the pharmacy or the pharmacist, working with social work at your cancer center, and then also contacting PanCan patient services to understand if there's some additional resources that may be available to help uh, offset the cost of those prescription pancreatic enzymes. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Great. Uh, you touched on so many important points, you know, the difference between the over-the-counter versus uh, prescription, um, the, the dosage. Um, can, can, does the doctor need to be involved in, in getting enzymes? So yes, uh, the, because the enzymes require a prescription, they, the, doctor need, the doctor or um, physician assistant or physician associate um, or the nurse practitioner. So it's not, doesn't always have to be 
the physician themselves, but somebody who is able to prescribe medications in the state, um, it's important that they are involved. What I find is that a lot of my doctors will prescribe enzymes and then refer the patient to me to really help with finding the dosage and titration. Mm -hmm. So I will um, then go back to the doctor and say, hey, I, I recommend that we go ahead and increase the number of capsules that this patient's taking, but they'll need an updated prescription so that they will have enough pills that will last them for the full 30 or 90 days. But yes, it is absolutely important that the doctor nurse practitioner or PA is involved with that prescription and with making adjustments to that prescription. And you point out again, just how important it is, the role that the dietitian plays in really working with that patient to determine what's best for them and it might not be what's you know best for their neighbor or someone else who, who's dealing with pancreatic cancer. So again, just that important role that the dietitian plays in all of that. So Maria, PanCan has published peer-reviewed articles using data from our PanCan patient registry and in partnership with our Precision Promise Supportive Care Committee about the importance of enzymes and recommending aggressive treatment of pancreatic associated weight loss. You are part of um, that committee and an author on the publication. Can you explain from a high level what, why, what that publication showed us? So um, basically what we see in the literature and in practice and what we, we wrote about in, in that um, specific publication is that there are multiple factors that can affect um, an individual with pancreatic cancer and their ability to maintain um, or gain or um, stabilize their weight. Um, the, the, one of the factors can be pancreatic insufficiency, but what we do know is that the ability to stabilize weight, so not necessarily even regain, but the ability to stabilize weight is associated with being able to stay on um, the prescribed dose and, and treatment regimen. Um, also can have um, beneficial um, improvements with, with overall survival. Um, even in individuals who maybe are struggling with treatment um, or potentially have a palliative course at that point, being able to maintain weight can be really beneficial. Um, what, with regards to pancreatic enzymes, what we found and, and what we see in the literature, um, what was found through the, examining the database is that a lot of patients, unfortunately, are, are not diagnosed with pancreatic enzyme insufficiency and are not prescribed enzymes. And we, we know that um, essentially in, in the US, um, pancreatic enzymes are underutilized compared to uh, the numbers of patients that we see in small sample sizes um, in, in, uh, when patients are, are examined very closely for pancreatic insufficiency. Um, we, we have an expectation that um, on a larger scale, much more, many more patients actually have pancreatic insufficiency than are diagnosed or prescribed enzymes. So we really find bottom line, what we keep going back, back to here is um, that it's important for patients to be in tune with their body, understand what the symptoms of exocrine insufficiency are, um, understand if they're having weight loss, that it's not, a, it's not automatic that every patient with pancreatic cancer will have weight loss or have uncontrolled weight loss. So really um, being in tune with your body and really advocating for yourself, advocating with the prescriber, with the doctor, if you um, think that you have exocrine insufficiency, advocating for additional testing or for a prescription. If you are at a cancer center, maybe you don't have um, as much access to a dietitian at the cancer center, advocating to find a dietitian in your community who can help you with side effect management, with strategies for increasing intake and with use of pancreatic enzymes to really help achieve weight stability if, if at all possible. 
Great, thank you. And thank you for reminding patients and families to be good patient advocates, that it's okay to question things. It's okay to look information up and ask your, your doctor or one of your care team members about it, um, that, that, that that's okay. And there's probably an answer. Someone will be able to help you um, take care of that symptom and, and feel better. I'll also put a plug in for PanCan's patient registry. Um, we, we encourage patients to go in and tell us your story about what you've experienced because we really do use that information to learn and help to change best practices for patients in the future. So, so thank you. Um, so Jennifer, back to you. We've just heard a lot of information about the importance of enzymes. Can you share your experiences as a patient taking enzymes? Yeah, absolutely. And first, what does titration mean? That's a new word to me. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I appreciate. It. So essentially, that means that maybe the dose um, that you're started on doesn't completely minimize or eliminate the symptoms of insufficiency. And so dose titration may be increasing the number of capsules okay. in, in a, a regimented way or potentially decreasing the number of right. capsules. But it's trying to find that individual dose that is going to minimize those symptoms right. of insufficiency um, with, with the least number of, of capsules. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I am um, pretty soon after Whipple and chemo, I started enzymes. And I still continue to take them. And yeah, both my oncologist, my surgeon have said, you know, kind of try it out. You know, I've sort of started with two capsules per meal, maybe one with a um, snack. Um, but maintaining my weight is probably the primary reason, the primary benefit I'm getting from the enzymes. Um, before I started my pancreatic cancer journey, I weighed about 128 pounds. I got down to 93 pounds after um, surgery and chemo. With chemo, as you've said, nothing tasted good. And what was so frustrating, and this happened to me one day, I was getting my treatment. My husband went and got me some tomato bisque soup. I ate every morsel of it. Oh, yay, finally, something that tastes good. Awesome. We picked up like a quarter of it on the way home. By the time I got home four hours later, this tastes terrible. I can't eat it. It was so frustrating. My husband was incredibly patient with me because, you know, it was so hard for really a couple months. I basically lived on carnation instant breakfast and cream of rice. That was like the only things that tasted good and I could keep down. And so finally, um, after seven rounds of Falfirinex, my liver wasn't doing well. So we stopped chemo, happiest day of my life. Um, I also had really bad mouth sores, which makes it really challenging to eat anything when your mouth is full of sores. Um, and, and I had gotten to 93 pounds. So um, that was rough. And so slowly after, you know, the chemo kind of worked itself out. And again, I've been off treatment for two years now. I stopped chemo two years ago. Um, so now I'm, I've stayed pretty steady right around 115, you know, but my weight can range five pounds in a day. I might be 111 or 110 first thing in the morning. And then if I weigh myself right after a meal, maybe I'm 116. So I don't worry about that a lot. But I, I mean, my, my issue is definitely keeping, keeping my weight up, which to everything you all have said, it really reiterates how important it is, to the, the idea of the food journal. I mean, writing down what I eat, what time I eat, did I take enzymes, how many, I have a purple pill box with my enzymes, you know, every day of the week, because I forget, you know, I'm 60, did I take, I mean, it, there's been times they've been hiding under my plate, and then I go to clear my plate, and I'm like, oh, there's my enzymes, I forgot to take them, so, you know, really keeping track of that, and as you all have said, sometimes a not wanted side effect of eating something doesn't show up for 24 hours to 36 hours. So if all of a sudden I eat something for lunch and then I have this really extra loose bowel movement, I'm like, what in the world? But then I think, oh, it's because of what I ate yesterday for lunch. So that's why it's so important 
just for our own selves, but then to be able to come to dietitians and say, okay, here's what's been going on. Here's what I've noticed. Here's, you know, what helps. And then that will help um, to, to figure out the dosage. So yeah, I, my oncologist said, Hey, try, try going a week without enzymes because I've never had dumping syndrome. She said some of her patients within, you know, practically minutes, if they haven't had their enzymes, their food is out. And I've never had that. So I thought, oh, okay, sure. I'll try it for a week. But I definitely noticed my weight was going down. So for me, that is a big reason why I need to um, stay on top of the enzymes. And I did write down for myself, take uh, my first enzyme right at the beginning of the meal <laughs> and take another pill. So thank you. I'm learning so much. This is great. But definitely, as you said, each person is so different and I can't remember, gee, did I go to the bathroom this morning? That was a lot, it was a little. So I write all of that down. Um, so then I can give the most informed information to those of you who can piece it together and help me. That's wonderful, Jennifer. Thank you so much for, for sharing and being so real. I know um, this is resonating with so many patients um, right now. So so thank you for, for sharing um, all of that. So I'm, I'm also thrilled that we have here joining us for this event, one of our patient services case managers, Daima. Um, we often, of course, hear about patients having trouble getting their enzymes covered by insurance. Daima, can you share about PanCan's financial financial navigation program in partnership with the Patient Advocate Foundation that may be able to help them? Sure. So the program is an extension of PanCam Patient Services. So it's our commitment to provide free one-to-one -one support for pancreatic cancer patients and their families. So the program provides expert guidance on complex financial and insurance issues such as enzyme coverage. So the Patient Advocate Foundation case management team can help patients by reducing their financial burden with charitable and community resources, but then patients can also reach out for other services such as filing for an appeal for insurance or locating and applying for copayment assistance and, pay and premium assistance. Great. Daima, can you talk about some of the um, information and resources that patient services provides to patients and caregivers about diet and nutrition? Yeah, sure. So patient services well, PanCan Patient Services, excuse me, it provides a wide range of general diet and nutrition resources. So we have resources to address common nutritional challenges mentioned earlier, like weight loss, poor appetite, um, pancreatic insufficiency. And we also recognize that each patient is different. Each patient has specific nutritional needs. So we really recommend that patients have access to pancreatic enzymes, that they consult with a registered dietitian, and for this reason, we do have resources available to connect patients with a registered dietitian in their area. And then lastly, we have a free diet and nutrition booklet that provides the management techniques and management tips for common nutritional challenges. It has healthy eating recommendations as well as sample meal plans. And it is available in a hard copy and a digital version. So patients and caregivers can contact PanCan Patient Services to receive a copy. Great, and I know that is one of our most popular resources and both Maria and Janine have helped in, in rewriting that and keeping that resource um, up to date over the years. So Diana, just to bring this to life, can you share a specific example of someone that you've been able to help related to their diet and nutrition needs? And do you feel this is one of the most meaningful uh, parts of your work at PanCan, helping patients and caregivers in this way? For sure. Um, I recently had a call with a caregiver whose loved one was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And the caregiver pretty much expressed that after the diagnosis, their loved ones um, experienced a loss of appetite. And they really didn't know where to turn, who to turn to. So we just started off by discussing some of those nutritional tips for overcoming a poor appetite, which really led into us discussing, you know, meeting with a registered dietitian, getting access to pancreatic enzymes. And for me, I could just hear the boost of confidence in a caregiver's voice after, you know, as answering plenty of questions and just going over a lot of material. And that's what is the most meaningful to me is just knowing that I'm not only empowering patients and caregivers, 
but also becoming a part of their journey. And, you know, that's priceless. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. And, and and we do hear so much from, from patients and caregivers, especially that diet and nutrition is one of the parts of this diagnosis that they can control, that they feel like they, you know, can go into their kitchen and they can help the patient do the right thing um, and help them with these symptoms. So it really is an area that I think empowers uh, patients and caregivers to feel like they're really um, able to help and support the patient in their life. So we are getting lots of questions um, from the audience. This is a very popular topic. Um, so Janine, a, a question coming in from someone. Many people um, warn patients not to eat any sugar. What's your advice? That's a great question. And one I'm sure Maria and myself encounter um, on a daily basis. Um, but I'm hoping in just a couple of minutes uh, to ease uh, your minds um, because I think it does cause a lot of stress and anxiety um, in patients, um, especially um, if, if they're told not to eat sugar and like, what does that mean? Um, so I just to sort of simplify it, would just say that, of course, um, in, in terms of you know, when you go online and, and read sugar feeds cancer, I, I would have to say that, well, sugar feeds every cell, um, cancer cells and healthy cells. And sugar comes in a wide variety of foods, right? It comes in refined sugars or simple sugars and cakes, cookies, pies, but it also comes in what we refer to as complex, complex carbohydrates. So that would be rice, pasta, cereal, fruit, um, starchy vegetables like potatoes, sweet potatoes, winter squash, legumes, so really nourishing food. So, um, so you'd really have to avoid all of that range of foods from simple sugars to complex carbohydrates, right? To sort of, oh, I'm gonna starve the cancer, but it's really not possible, especially in patients with pancreatic cancer who are trying to maintain their weight. And like Jennifer was talking about earlier, um, their food choices become, um, can become very limited when they become symptomatic or their favorite foods drop off the surface of their choices and they're just trying to find anything that works. So the last thing we really wanna do is restrict anybody from anything. Um, I would just say that complex carbohydrates are going to of course offer more nutrients, right? That's sort of a given. Um, but I think that the other layer to that is that indirectly, um, when you look at a diet, maybe that has a lot of processed foods in it, um, and I'm talking from the prevention standpoint, um, or a lot of um, um, uh, simple or refined sugars in their diet, um, that, sort of, that has the propensity of promoting insulin, which the pancreas also makes. Um, and that, that insulin is a growth hormone, and there's thought that that could potentiate or influence cancer cell growth. Um, so, so that's sort of looking at it from an indirect, but by no means I, would I want to incite fear in patients with who are already struggling with food choices yeah. um, that they can relax and if they need to enjoy a bowl of ice cream at night because that's all they wanna have, I think that's fine. I'm sure that's music to many people's ears um, to be able to still know they can have their ice cream or that, that slice of cake. Um, so Janine, another question from the audience um, on a similar line, why do some doctors tell patients that they can eat anything and everything if they're struggling with weight loss? Is this an acceptable approach and what's your advice? Okay, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, going back to when I, maybe the first couple of questions that I answered, um, we, we were talking about putting calories in a framework of healthy choices. Um, but at times when treatment becomes really hard on patients and limits their choices, like we talked about just earlier, um, I think it comes down to just finding foods that work. Um, and that can be a very narrow choice of foods and maybe the same foods that didn't work the next day, like you were talking about, Jennifer, it's so mm -hmm. common to hear that. Well, one food worked one day, but the next day it was totally awful and didn't talk at all or it wasn't, the taste was off. Um, so I think what they're trying to tell their patients in defense of our oncologists 
um, that they're trying to say, hey, we don't want you to restrict un unnecessarily, um, that all foods can work um, and working with a dietitian and finding those foods that can work um, and trying to provide as much of a wholesome diet as possible, but knowing that everyone's human too. And those choices may not line up as the healthiest foods that they could consume and that's okay. Yep. Great. Um, so here's another question kind of going down a different angle um, around prevention. Uh, Janine, is there a specific diet to prevent pancreatic cancer in otherwise healthy individuals? You know, looking at the evidence, um, the strongest evidence would be around um, maintaining a healthy body weight. And to include with that, um, um, avoiding a lot of weight gain as an adult. Um, to a lesser degree, less evidence, limited evidence would be around um, red meat, processed meats, saturated fats, um, sugar in the diet, a simple refined sugars, um, as well as alcohol. So to a lesser degree, I mean, a less evidence, limited evidence around those kinds of foods that we look at in terms of increasing risk. Um, I think I would the message I would say too, and it's just that, um, you know, the cancer, the American Cancer Society, the American Institute of Cancer Research, they provide great evidence-based guidelines to help us in making our decisions around diet choices. And I would definitely um, go to AICR, org AICR.org as a resource because they can line, they align with evidence-based guidelines that patients can go by in terms of decreasing risk for many cancers, as well as other comorbidities that we can encounter in our adult life, including cardiac health, diabetes. So it's not just looking at pancreatic cancer, but decreasing your risk for all cancers too. Great, and thank you for pointing out evidence-based um, information and resources are really critical that, that patients are getting um, the right information um, that, that has been researched um, um, in order to, to guide the decisions um, in, in their life. Um, Maria, another question coming in from the audience. Um, is there any research suggesting that patients with pancreatic or GI cancers have unique nutritional needs compared to other cancer patients? There's not really any specific um, special need for individuals with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer or other GI cancers. Um, we do know that in, with cancer in general and treatments for cancer, patients' needs for protein are a little more elevated. Mm -hmm. But with regards to anything specific, not because of the cancer diagnosis itself. Um, we do, however, know that um, surgeries that alter the GI tract, um, so surgeries for pancreatic cancer or other gastrointestinal cancers, can alter the body's ability to um, digest or absorb certain nutrients and more often um, certain vitamins and minerals. And Janine touched on that a little bit, um, fat-soluble vitamins, iron, B12 um, are, are more common, though in general, they're pretty um, uncommon in individuals that are um, that don't have symptoms of malabsorption. So ultimately, there's not anything specific or anything different for an individual who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer or other GI cancers, um, other than these things we've we've been talking about um, throughout the discussion today maintaining, working to maintain weight, getting adequate protein, trying to um, lean towards health and a healthier diet and more complex carbohydrates as able. Mm -hmm. um, but with regards to surgical changes of the GI tract, um, I do recommend that you um, continue follow-up with um, your surgeon or and or with a dietitian on a more long-term basis so that you can be monitored for potential vitamin mineral um, absorption issues and those can be caught early and um, and replaced and supplemented as appropriate. 
Great, just again, emphasizing the importance of bringing a dietitian into your care um, very early in your diagnosis. Um, so Maria, there's been a few questions um, that have come in about exercise, which related to diet and nutrition. Um, can you speak to physical activity after diagnosis? Is, is it okay to exercise if you feel up to it? Or what about if you don't really have the energy to exercise? Absolutely. And I think that at this point in time, uh, uh, dietitians do get quite a few questions about physical activity because the field of exercise oncology is, is um, more is emerging. So um, there are definitely um, experts in that field. But with regards to general um, recommendations about physical activity, um, absolutely, it's really important to be physically active. The American Cancer Society um, ha recommends, and, and through that evidence-based, um, these evidence-based recommendations, the, uh, the goal would be 150 minutes per week of cardiac or aerobic activity, and then um, resistance or strength training activities at least twice per week. That can seem really daunting if you think about 150 minutes. But what we want to do and what we can do, especially for those that are struggling with just regular, um, their regular daily activities, is really trying to break that down into 10 minute increments or maybe even five minute increments. Physical activity has been shown to help improve health related quality of life, decrease anxiety and depression, help improve sleep. Um, and then also just the, the you know, obvious things of maintaining strength, maintaining performance status. So every little bit of exercise that somebody can do is really impactful and can be really helpful. So not shying away from activity. If, if you don't have the stamina to do 30 minutes at a time, doing 10 minutes or even five minutes of activity. Um, if it's hard or if, you're if it's hard to think about getting out of bed or getting off of a chair or if your balance is not perfect, um, even doing exercises in a chair, um, putting on music and dancing in a chair, um, doing uh, stretches and some strengthening activities from a chair or from bed, any bit of activity can definitely be really helpful. Um, if you are able to engage with a specialist in exercise oncology, um, that could be a physical therapist, a physical medicine doctor, an exercise physiologist, um, that can be, or even a personal trainer, um, that can be really helpful to help give guidance. Um, there is a specialty certification um, in cancer exercise. So a certified cancer exercise trainer is a specific certification that's available through a partnership of the American Cancer Society and um, the American uh, College of Sports Medicine. So um, if, if you have the ability to meet with someone with that, that certification, then you know that they have specific training in oncology or in cancer exercise. Um, not to say that someone who doesn't have that certification is not um, qualified to provide exercise recommendations to you, but certainly as, as a um, looking in the community for somebody that might be helpful, if there's not somebody available through your cancer center, that might be a good place to start. Terrific. Those are some really great tips. So Daima, what would you say to patients and caregivers out there who are not sure that they would benefit from calling PanCan's patient services? Yeah, so I would say it's normal for patients and caregivers to be unsure about what they may benefit from by contacting PanCan patient services, but that's really why PanCan patient services is here to answer any questions, to provide information and the tools that will help patients and caregivers along their journey. So I encourage all patients and caregivers to contact PanCan Patient Services, even if you don't know where to start, because we really are here to help patients get on the right track. 
Wonderful. And it's a case management system we should mention. that. So if someone were to call in and get connected to Dyema as an example, as their case manager, the next time they call in, they would be reconnected to Dyema and continue that conversation. So just a, it becomes a, an important person in, in your journey with, with this disease. So Jennifer, I'm going to give you the last word here. What is one piece of advice that you would give to patients out there who are listening right now? Well, this, this has been super encouraging uh, for me. I've been taking notes for myself and all, but I think, I think stay positive. You know, if, if, you, if you are out there as a survivor, hey, yay, you're alive. You know? And uh, as we all know, pancreatic cancer has a dismal, uh, you know, survival rate. So, so I think stay positive. I super appreciated my surgeon very early on in the process just said, you know, go live your life, schedule your, uh, schedule your medical appointments around your life. Don't schedule your life around your medical appointments. My husband and I, in fact, are getting ready to move uh, from Cincinnati. He's retiring. We're moving to Williamsburg, Virginia, a place we both absolutely love. <laughs> and, you know, so, but I'll, I'll come back every six months to, for the next couple of years to see my oncologist and surgeon. I want to, I want to stay with them, but I think stay positive, um, be grateful. Uh, none of us knows how long we're going to be around. So it's important to be grateful every day. I personally have a very strong faith in God and uh, am in part of a worldwide fellowship. So I literally have thousands of people who have been praying for me. And I truly believe that's uh, certainly given me a lot of strength and a, and a lot of uh, joy and confidence. And, uh, you know, I, my prayer is that I'll be around to see my three grandchildren who right now are ages three or under, uh, you know, to be around long enough to for them to know me, to remember me themselves and not just, here's a picture of the lady that was your grandma and she was really nice, you know? So I hope to be a, you know, very long-term survivor. I've told God that I prefer not to die from pancreatic cancer and, uh, but I'm also 63, so who knows? But I think that's what I would say, stay positive, stay grateful. If you're a praying person, definitely pray. And the things that I've gotten from today is really become an expert on your own body and then share that with the experts who can guide you in what to eat and the medicines to, you know, the dosages and all that and all of that, but they need to have accurate information and, and you, you know, the patient's the only one who can provide that. Um, so thank you so much. This has been a, a terrific help. Uh, for me personally. Well, thank you, Jennifer. That's perfect advice. And I think we can all say that we're just so inspired by your positive energy and your advice to everyone else to stay positive. So thank you so much for, for sharing your story. Janine, Maria, Daima, Jennifer, this has been wonderful. You guys were fantastic and provided so much Per, really critical information to patients and families out there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for taking the time to join us today. And thank you to everyone out there watching. A lot of information was provided today and PanCam Patient Services can help patients and caregivers navigate all of it. Contact PanCam Patient Services to speak with one of our highly trained and informed managers like Dyema. Case managers are ready to take your calls and emails Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. The phone number and email are on the screen. Thank you for joining us today. Remember to register to come take steps with us at PanCam Purple Strad on April 30th. We would love to see you there. Visit pancan.org to get started. Again, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. You make our mission possible. Please stay safe and be well.